Would you join me in prayer? Father, thank you today, Lord, that you have given us this opportunity, this privilege to stand here and to be able to preach from your word. Lord, I thank you that, uh, Father, you have just given us everything that we need. Lord, you help us in so many ways in our life each and every day, and we just want to say thank you. I love how the song says, uh, repeats the words of the psalm, blessed be your name. And God, your name is blessed today. And so, Father, as I stand here today, I would just ask that you would forgive me of the sin that is in my life, that you would place it beneath the blood of Jesus. Lord, I realize I stand here today as a sinner, and I need forgiveness of my sin. And so I plead the blood of Jesus. Help us today as we study this passage and we study your word. Lord, I pray that you would speak to us in a very real way. Lord, thank you for loving us. Thank you for saving us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much. You may be seated. Again, I want you to leave your Bible open to this passage because we're really just going to be covering these two verses today. I want to start out with a couple questions that I want to ask you, and they're personal questions. The first question would be this, do you ever get frustrated in your walk with God? And I'm not talking about being frustrated with God, I'm talking about being frustrated with yourself. You know you should be living better, you know you should be doing better, you know what's required of you as a child of God, but you have continually failed God. Another way to ask that question is, are you pleased with the life that you're living right now for Jesus? Now, I know I might sound like a broken record sometimes, but these are questions I repeat often because I want us to think about it. A third question would simply be, is God pleased with you? Do you realize that's the most important question that can be asked? Is God pleased with the way that I'm living? One final question would be, what is it in my life that needs to change? When I think about my walk with God on a daily basis, and I know that God knows all my thoughts, He knows all my needs, He knows all my desires, He knows all my failures. What is it that needs to change with me personally? Well, Paul addresses that in this very passage that we read today. And in fact, it causes, he answers the question that many of us struggle with, and that is, can a person really change? We've all seen people stray from the faith and some are quick to say, well, they must not be a believer. Well, that may be true, but that's not always the case, and I don't think we should give up. And the question is, can they change? And by change, I mean really changing. Stop being one way and start being another. And, and I'm not talking about developing some new philosophy or uh, developing some new religion. I'm talking about genuine change that comes from the inside out. Change that only God can do in your life. Well, let me give you a few examples. I want to make sure that we're all on the same page this morning because many of you may be thinking, yeah, I know somebody that needs to change. Well, maybe we're talking about you today. Is it possible to change from being insincere to a sincere Christian? Is it possible to change from being a lazy Christian to an industrious Christian? Is it possible from changing from being dishonest to honest. What about an angry person to being a peaceful and a grateful person? Selfish? Do you know any selfish people? Are you a selfish person? Can you change from that and become a generous person? I come back to that question I asked a moment ago, and that question is, can we change? Do we need to change? Do you know someone that needs to change? And I want to tell you this morning, yes, it can happen. Based upon what God's Word teaches us, and the Bible is so plain and laying out for us, yes, an individual can be changed. Now, if you've never accepted Christ as your Savior, that's the change you need. You need to commit your life to Him and live for Him. But folks, you and, as a, you and I as a Christian sometimes find ourselves in this situation that we need to change. But how does biblical change happen? How does this radical change that I'm talking about happen? Do you realize that most people are trapped in habits and behaviors and they begin each day getting up doing the same bad habits, the same behaviors, the same bad things they know they shouldn't be doing, and as a result of that, it's evidence you need to change if that describes you today. Well, biblical change requires some things. This is not the outline, but this may be just before the outline. I want you to jot these three things down. A biblical change requires time, effort, and strategy. 
If you want to change as a Christian, to be a better Christian, a better child of God, a more faithful child of God, it takes time, it takes effort, and it takes strategy. The truth of the matter is, if we can just cut through all of that stuff, the truth of the matter is, most people don't want to change. We resist change, even when it means changing for the better. We resist it even though we know that God tells us exactly how we should be living. Listen, biblical change, as I said first of all there, it takes time. Now can I just ask you what might be a humorous question? Who has time for that? Well the truth is, biblical change does take time. We're not just going to change overnight. We are a society of instant gratification. I was at McDonald's, this is my monthly McDonald's story, I was at McDonald's this week and uh, there was a lady in front of me, uh, there was two people in front of us, and I could just see she had places to be, she had things to do, and people to see, and she was just a mess. And she was talking to herself, she was talking to me, she was trying to get some support about how long are we going to have to wait in line, and we had just showed up. Instant gratification. We don't even want to wait for anything. Now the truth is, most of us want to be different in some area of our Christian life. We just want it to happen now. We don't want to take the time to make it happen. But biblical change takes time. You need to know that. There's a second thing about biblical change, and it takes effort, as I mentioned. You know, I could ask you a question today, who likes to make tough choices that's required for change? And I think all of us would say no. Uh, we don't like the tough things that are involved in making change in our life. If someone wants to make it for us, that's fine. But see, the truth is, sometimes it requires that we say yes when we should say no, and we say no when we should say yes. It takes effort on our part. I've often thought of the Christian life in this way. As we think about the Christian life taking effort, how many of you remember what it was like when you got saved? I mean, you left that day and you felt good and, and uh, you was going to tackle the world. And then you find out how much effort it is to live this Christian life on a daily basis. Would it not be nice if the day that you got saved, the pastor came up to you and he said, now, I've got... Ten prescriptions here, and this is an Apostle Paul prescription, this is an Apostle John, and you know, he just names all of them, and if you take this, you'll act just like them the rest of your life. Take one a day. Well, the truth is, it doesn't work that way, does it? We don't become a Christian and then get this pill that we take every day, and immediately we become holy and we live a life that's pleasing to God. No, biblical change in our life takes effort, and it takes effort every single day of our Christian life. We have not arrived to the point where we should be. Can we agree on that? We are not what we should be today. We may be progressing, but we're not there yet. Biblical change not only takes time and not only does it take effort, but do you know that biblical change takes strategy? You look at all the stories in Scripture and we find that it takes a little strategy. It's not wishful thinking. A month and a half ago, I received an email from a church member, and it said something like this. I don't remember the exact details, but it said something like this. Pastor, I heard you make the comment that you wanted to try to lose some weight, and so here's a diet that you can try. God bless. I hope that it works well. Here's the strategy. Now, let me just say this. Anytime somebody sends you something saying, this is what you need to do to lose weight, it's a sure sign you need to lose weight. <laughs> there's, there's no doubt about that. And I thought, well, I'll, I'll, I'll try it. Why not? They obviously think that I need to, to lose weight and uh, bought bigger suits. It doesn't hide it, so why not? And you will be happy to know that in the month and a half that I've been on this diet, I have gained five pounds so far. <laughs> Problem is I'm following the wrong strategy. Well, the same is true in our Christian life. There's nothing more frustrating than putting all your time and your energy into efforts and a strategy and getting no results. You know what I said at the end of that month and a half? I said, it ain't worth it. Well, it's not that it wasn't worth it. I didn't follow all the steps in the, in the process. But change takes time. Biblical change takes effort. Biblical change takes a strategy. Now, I'm talking about biblical change. Do you want that in your life? 
What if we met Jesus today? Could he honestly say, well done, my good and faithful servant, enter into the joys of of the Lord. What's his desire for us? Did you know that God wants us to be like Jesus? Jesus wants us to be like him. He wants us to be conformed into his image. Now when I think about that, I realize how far I have to go. Now there's a component to this key biblical, this biblical change that I want you to see, and it's found in verse 2 of Romans chapter 12 that we read today, and let's read it again. Paul says it this way, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may be perfect, what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. What's Paul saying? If you want change, guess where it starts? It starts in your mind. Do you know when the Bible talks about the heart in the Psalms? Do you know what he's talking about? He's talking about the mind. Mind is where this change has to take place. And so the first challenge is to really stop thinking the way that the world thinks. That's hard to do when we live in the world and we are around worldly people and we're around sinful people. You say, well, how does the world think? Well, the world has a definition of what's right and what's wrong. In fact, if you truly claim to be a Christian today and you stand up for what the Bible says is right, and what the Bible says it wrong, is wrong, the world will look at you and they will say you are judgmental. They will say you're not right. They will say you're wrong and God never meant for that to be right or wrong. That's what the world will say. And what we have to say is, well, thank you for your opinion, even though I didn't ask, but I really don't care about your opinion. I care about what God says. And God says this is right and this is wrong. You know what else the world says? The world says that everything in this world revolves around you. It's about your happiness. That's what it's really all about. God says it's not about your happiness. If you want to be happy, learn to worship Him. Learn to serve Him because that's where true happiness comes into play. Paul said, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, I want to make very clear what I'm saying here. I'm not just talking about positive thinking. I am going to mention that here in just a moment. But I'm talking about renewing your mind through biblical thinking. Now catch that, there's a difference between positive thinking and biblical thinking. If you want to experience biblical change in your life, you need to train yourself to think a new way, and it goes against everything that the world is teaching you. And so today I want to talk about this biblical change that can take place in our life. Some ways that Paul would suggest that we should think, and I want to give you four of them this morning. Here they are. Number one, think spiritual thoughts, not material thoughts. Do you hear that? Think spiritual thoughts, not material thoughts. Do you know there is more to the Christian life than just obeying a bunch of rules? And we have to understand that the Christian life is a spiritual event. As a Christian, what is the source of our joy, our strength, our happiness, our protection, and everything else that we have? It's a spiritual relationship with Christ. You can't miss that. It is a spiritual relationship, it's a personal relationship, and it is a spiritual world that we live in. Paul is not talking about the physical, money, success. I mentioned this this morning, I don't know how many of you feel this way, but the older I get, the less material things really matter to me. The closer I get to heaven, the more I realize how important my relationship with God is, and the less I worry about material things. Jot this down in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 12. Listen to what Paul said to the church at Corinth. He said, now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit of God the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us by God. We live in a spiritual world. Think spiritual thoughts, not material thoughts. Paul's saying, don't be conformed to this world. Don't be caught up in all of that because one day it's going to pass away. Now here's the second thing I think we could learn from this passage, and that is we need to think positive thoughts, not negative thoughts. 
Now, I was very clear just a minute ago when I just made this statement that I'm not just talking about positive thinking. I'm talking about biblically using positive thinking. I want you to listen to this. Though not all positive thinking is biblical, all biblical thinking is positive. I want to say that one more time. Though not all positive thinking is biblical. There's a lot of positive thinking that uh, some evangelical preachers will tell you uh, to think. And not all of that is biblical, but all biblical thinking is positive. Why? Because when God is involved, the outcome is always good. Do you believe that? If God's involved... It's going to be good. Why do I get up every week and say God is good all the time and you say all the time God is good? Because everything that God is involved in that we're doing here is going to be good. That means even if the process is painful, even if it's a test, even if it's a trial, ultimately the outcome is always going to be good. And we know that because Scripture teaches us that. But wait a minute. If your thoughts are constantly hopelessness, in despair, you're not thinking biblically. And the question may be, I need to change my thought process. Well, life is just hard and things are so bad and, and woe is me. That's not biblical. We need to have a biblical positive thought in our life. Scripture teaches me, greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Why do you think we were taught that lesson? Because we need to remember. Satan doesn't have the last say. God has written this Bible. God has the last say. Read the Bible. And guess who wins at the end of the book? Do I need to tell you who wins? That settles it all. Because God, in the end, wins it all. There's an old song that says, My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and His righteousness. Isn't that true? That's what our hope is, is built on. Now who am I talking to today? I'm talking to any of you out there that define yourself as Mr. or Mrs. Negative. That you wake up every day and the world is just such a negative place. It's all doom and gloom and, and I've listened to the radio and I've watched TV and, and things are just so bad and as a result it is affecting the way that you live for the Lord now. That's not thinking biblically. Do you really believe that God wants you to wake up every day and just be in despair and gloom about what's going on in the world? By the way, remember God created this world. He knows exactly what's going on in this world. Paul said it this way in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8, very familiar passage. He said, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true and honest and just and pure and lovely and of good report, think on these things. That is positive biblical thinking. That's not wishful thinking. That's not hopeful thinking. We have a command from Scripture to put biblical thoughts into our life. Maybe what we need to say to Mr. Doom and Gloom and Mrs. Doom and Gloom is stop saying, why are you so always negative? Maybe we need to look them in the eye and say, why are you so unbiblical? Because the truth of the matter is, that's what they're doing. They're being unbiblical by allowing that stuff in their life. You know, nowhere in the Bible, and I've read the Bible many times, but nowhere in the Bible have I ever read where the Bible says, think negative thoughts. If there's anything that's bad, if there's anything that's corrupt, if there's anything that's miserable, if there's anything that's hopeless, if there's anything that's going to bring you down, if there's anything that's going to cause you despair, think on these things because they'll make you feel better. Scripture doesn't teach that. No, in fact, Scripture teaches the exact opposite of that, and it teaches us to have biblical thoughts. Oh, Satan would say to you today, you're a wretched old sinner. You hear people say that sometime in their testimony. I'm just a wretched old sinner. Well, good for you. I'm a redeemed saint. I'm not a wretched old sinner. I'm a child of God. I belong to God. You can live that way if you want, but I am redeemed. Jesus says I have grace. I have more grace than I'll ever need. And he says he shows me his grace each and every day. Now the question today is, which one do you want to focus on? Well, Think positive thoughts, not negative, because positive thoughts can be biblical thoughts. Here's a third thing I want us to see here and think about in this passage, and that is to think hope, not despair. It's amazing the Bible has a whole lot to say about hope. And do you know what another word for hope is? 
the word optimism. I'd write that down, optimism. Hope and optimism, it's the assurance that everything is going to be okay. Listen, sometimes we just need to step back and say, man, it's, it's going to be all right. I mean, things are going to be okay. Yeah, but what do we do about our president? What do we do about the last 10 we have and the world's messed up? And oh my goodness, I mean, if you're on social media, um, I love TikTok, and I know most of you don't even know what TikTok is, but I love watching that. And the reason I love watching that is because people are constantly predicting uh, all these things that's going to happen, and it's just comical to me. I mean, man, before the election, you know, we were going to be, just all kinds of stuff was going to happen. And the truth of the matter is the world wants to hear that. The world wants to believe that things are just so bad that we'll never get out of it. Listen, my hope is not in the world. My hope is in Christ, and that will not change. Paul said it this way in Romans 8, 28, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God and to them who are called according to his purpose. I want you to try to do something for me today. I want you to look at the person next to you, and if nobody's next to you, just say it to yourself. You have permission to talk to yourself. I want you to look at them, and I want you to say, it's going to be okay. Okay, now th this time, I don't want you to say it like you're at the library. I want you to say it like you're at church and you believe it. Look at the person next to you and say, it's going to be okay. Now, I want you to believe that. Now, you know why some of you couldn't say that and some of you didn't want to hear somebody say that? Because you would much rather believe it's not going to be okay. You would rather have this idea that, yeah, you say that, but when I leave here, if you only knew my life, well, I'm sorry your life's so messed up, but can I introduce you to somebody named Jesus that can help you with some of those details of your life? It doesn't mean your life's going to be perfect. It doesn't mean things are always going to be grand. But it means our hope is not in this world. It means that God is in control. And if God is in control, then you have a reason to be optimistic because in the end, God has the final say. Think spiritual thoughts, not material. Think positive thoughts, not negative. Think hope, not despair. There's one final biblical form of thinking here. Think eternity, not temporary. How many of you remember the hymn, This World is Not My Home, I'm Just Passing Through, My Treasures Are Laid Up Somewhere Beyond the Blue? The Apostle Peter said it this way. He said that we are strangers in this world. You know why you may be so stressed out today? Because you don't realize you're a stranger. You are an alien to this world. This world is not your home. And if your focus is on this world, of course you're going to be miserable. But when our focus is our trust is in Christ and we're going to spend eternity with Christ, it changes the way that we live. Paul said this in Colossians 3.2. He said, set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. I don't know why I feel the need to say this about three times a month. Turn off the TV. <laughs> Turn off the radio. Pick up your Bible. Yeah, but I have to know what's going on. Do you? Are you? Is it really going to change anything? All you're doing is getting yourself upset. All you're doing is causing your blood pressure to go up. And might I add, you're probably going to die early because of it. Is that what you really want for your life? Paul says, set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. It's amazing to me how many things we worry about that you know, 10 years from now, we won't even remember we was worried about those things. Do you realize that? We spend a lot of time being worried and concerned and stressing and being upset about, I mean, I have literally, I know people that are so mad that Joe Biden is president, they can't get through a single day and be happy about it. Well, let me tell you something. In four or eight more years, he's not going to be president, so move on with it. Be happy. Just one day, it's not going to matter in the realm of things. This world is not our home. And the church has made a mistake in feeling as though somehow this world is going to change. 
Friends, when I read the Bible, what I read is the world's going to get worse and worse. I'm going to keep my focus on Christ. I'm going to keep my focus on eternity. I want to be involved in things that's going to make an eternal difference. I want to tell people that this is not all there is to offer. Paul says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I want you to think about these four biblical steps, these four biblical things to think about today. And just use it as a checklist in your own spiritual life. Are you thinking spiritual thoughts or are you thinking material thoughts? Are you thinking positive biblical thoughts or are you thinking constantly negative thoughts? Do you think hope or do you think despair? Are you thinking about eternity or are you focused on the temporary? Folks, God has it in control. Do you remember the ch child song, children's song that we used to sing? He's got the whole world in his hands. See, I think some Christians think that he's dropped the ball. Some Christians think that, well, it's in his hands, but things are so shaky. What if he, he just drops it? He created it. You and I are in the very palm of his hand. I'm content. I'm comfortable with being in the hands of the God that created the universe. That's a good place to be. Can we ask God to help us today not to be so consumed, as Paul said, with the things of this world, but focus on spiritual things? Will you do that today? It'll change your life. Let's stand together as we go to the Lord in prayer. Father, as we come to you today, I want to thank you for this privilege and this opportunity that we have had to stand here and to be able to share from your word. Lord, I thank you today for your word and for your words that you have given to us today. Thank you, God, that as we look at this passage, you remind us not to be conformed to this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of our mind, to focus on those things that are good and acceptable and the will of God. Lord, help us today to be focused on the will of God. Help us today as a church to be focused on your kingdom, and the things that you would have us do. Father, we thank you and we love you and we praise you for giving us the privilege and opportunity just to stand here and to be able to share your word. And so, Lord, I'm asking today that you would just continue to speak to us now, even during this time of invitation. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.